We're joined now by security expert and CEO of Bacon Security and Intelligence Limited, Dr. Kabir Adamu. Good to see you and thanks for your time. Well, uh, it looks very much like a, a hapless NSA there uh, because uh, away from curses. Uh, how does it work? Give us a sense of how it works. Uh, we thought that uh, when you talk about the armory or the magazine where these uh, weapons are kept, uh, anyone going in and coming out must have uh, a record to show that uh, well, you've been able to account for that weapon. Uh, but in this case, the NSA hasn't told Nigerians how these uh, have gone and uh, if at all anyone is on trial. Kabir? Um, yes, uh, Suleiman. That, that's uh, what we are hoping to hear. Uh, you, you recall that a few weeks ago, it was revealed that the president has assent assented to the bill which is now an act uh, for the creation of the Center for Small Arms and Light Weapons that is domiciled in the Office of the National Security Advisor. If you look at that act, it uh, mandates that center to work with very, several, all the law enforcement agencies that are constitutionally allowed to carry weapons and ensure that the practices of the storage of those weapons meet global standards. And those um, practices are well documented uh, they include the integrity of the armory, they include the process of the storage, the release of the weapon, as well as the weapon handling capability of the operative in, in question. Now, we know that before now, um, all of these issues I've mentioned were faulty in most organizations. Perhaps if you isolate the military, um, almost all the other organizations that are constitutionally mandated to bear weapons have challenges with regards to the entire process that I've mentioned from the armory itself to the weapon handling capabilities, that's the training, as well as the release and um, recovery of the, the weapons. And then of course, to the process of even discharging on serviceable weapons. Now, this is not something that will happen in one day. Uh, what I would hope uh, is that the center that has just been created would conduct an audit um, across all the organizations um, identify what the faults are, and then start the process of working in particular with our development partners to assist us in correcting all of, all of this, these processes. Um, I, I think what the NSS say is the reality. However, it is the responsibility of especially the office that is domiciled inside its office to correct what he has, ma what he has mentioned. Uh, right, and two um, issues here. Uh, first off, in uh, the video that we've, I mean, uh, played since uh, yesterday when the NSA made this uh, revelation, uh, you see that um, this uh, recovered weapons that are said to be illicit but originally belonged to the federal government were being destroyed. Any, can you help us understand the logic behind uh, destroying these weapons? So it, it could be several reasons. Um, because it could be that those weapons are unserviceable. Um, that means, for instance, the, their lifespan has expired and they are, they are no longer usable for several reasons. Uh, uh, weapons are also, to an extent, machinery, dependent type of weapon. Some of them are automated. Others are you know, not automated, but uh, there are functions inside them that can grow faulty and that cannot be repaired after that. So it could be that. Or it could be, for instance, in certain, because we were aware that sometimes even when custom makes seizures of freshly imported weapons, they still go ahead and, and, and destroy them. So it could be a range of reasons from being unserviceable to the fact that uh, they are either not documented and the government feels that they may not in any way be useful to the law enforcement agencies and the security agencies in the country, and so they decide to, to destroy them. Uh, what I would have um, thought would be really useful, we've not been told, I hope that has been done, is that the before the destruction, they did take record, because every weapon has a marking. Uh, yes, criminals can remove that marking, but most countries, that's the first thing they do, to take note in a documented manner and lock those markings. It helps in future investigations. When you have those markings, it means that in the future, if anyone should use those weapons, um, then you can always go back and investigate from where those weapons come. So those are some of the responsibilities that this center will have to do to make sure that when we procure weapons, those weapons are 
locked, they are documented, the markings are clear, and it is known to which organization those particular weapons belong to. So that wherever those weapons are seen in the future, for example, before that destruction, they can check the lock and see that these particular weapons are coming from a particular organization. And then I would expect that the leadership of that organization will be queried to say, how did you allow these weapons to fall into the wrong hands? Or how come these weapons have now returned to us um, as the custodian of um, you know, the center within, within the country? So again, I, I want to emphasize that the work of the center is cut out for it. We've prayed over the last decade or, or more for that center. In fact, what we wanted was a commission. And that's what ECOWAS, the ECOWAS protocol actually recorded. But Nigeria did what it did. And today we have a center. It's better than nothing. So hopefully that center will go out and do what, what it's supposed to do and go go about mopping all of these weapons that are in the hands of um, persons that shouldn't have them. Well, uh, Kabir, yes, I, I recall that uh, you and your team, you've always uh, spoken about uh, the need for commission. But again, let's talk about preventative measures. Uh, what steps do you think the government can take to ensure that uh, uh, in the future, uh, such weapons don't get into the wrong hands? And public perception here, yeah, put this uh, side by side with that, uh, how does it sit well in the minds of uh, many Nigerians uh, who have just watched the NSA tell that story? Uh, so let me start from that. Uh, I think um, our public officials need to also be very mindful of the kind of statements uh, they make. Uh, the NSA in certain instances represents the highest level of um, you know, leadership within the security sector, uh, depending on how, how you look at it. And so uh, when he makes such statements, the interpretation uh, that most people would give to it is the level of, um, you know, uh, we've reached a point of no return as it were. Uh, and so I think uh, hopefully his office will come out with a follow up statement to show the steps that it, that office is taking to reduce uh, happenings like that. And um, that, that takes me to your question. How do we uh, ensure this doesn't happen? Number one is, uh, the existence of uh, a function within government. Uh, I would have hoped it's a commission, but it's not. It's a center. Uh, that center is domiciled within the Office of the National Security Advisor. Uh, some analysts are of the opinion that that the office should not be operational, and the existence of that center within the uh, office makes it uh, 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 trying to at, at acquire operational capabilities. So that the, the center may face that challenge. But having said that, we know already that the center has created six regional offices across the six geopolitical zones. And we know that it has appointed senior, uh, most of them retired uh, security personnel of very good standing. And they've gone about engaging with various stakeholders. And so the process is in place. Now, beyond that, the preventative measures would have to start from the process of procurement of um, those weapons. And I think that is where the difficulty is. Um, because of the corruption that surrounds procurement within Nigeria, uh, most of the organizations may not readily open their doors to the center to uh, assist or support them in the procurement process. I, earlier on, I talked about making sure that every weapon that comes into the country is locked. Those markings on those weapons are taken note of, and we make sure that there is a, uh, a repository within the center that stores all of that. That, that's the beginning. The other elements are around training for our personnel on weapons handling. I think the military has been an amazing job in that regard, but not so for the other security departments, starting from the police uh, down to the civil defense and the several other uh, organizations that do, do have um, you know, the mandate to carry weapons. Now, beyond that, the welfare of the personnel themselves, uh, you cannot arm someone and then subject him to the kind of horrid conditions that we've subjected our security personnel. It is um, a vulnerability that can be exploited by the, by the bad guys. Um, when criminals, for instance, want to incentivize them, it's really just about giving them money. But when you improve their welfare, it makes it a little bit difficult. Uh, spot um, on. Very, very quickly, uh, uh, Dr. Kabir Adamo, unfortunately, not much time. But when you hear from the Minister of Defense, Abu Bakar Baduru, that uh, government is aware that there is an emerging uh, terrorist group in Sokoto, uh, what do you make of that? Very quickly. Yes. Um, 
Uh, I mean, it, it's documented. Uh, the entire Sahel has a proliferation of, um, you know, different groups. And um, a couple of weeks ago, one particular group attempted to infiltrate KB State and attacked a community there. In Sokoto State, in Tangaza in particular, in the border area, we've seen instances where there have been incursions of these groups. So it's, it's well documented, actually, that um, the Northwest, the entire 1,600 kilometers of border between Nigeria and at least three countries, Niger, um, Chad, and to an extent Cameroon, is vulnerable to uh, this type of proliferation of um, groups that are affiliated with Ila Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State in West Africa province. And I am praying that the Nigerian security sector, not just the defense, but the entire security sector, take measures to implement the provisions of our counterterrorism strategy, which yeah. seeks to prepare, prevent, and plan against the uh, proliferation of this, these organizations. Um, again, it has to be a collaboration between the federal okay. and, and state government, as well right. as the now soon to be autonomous local governments. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabira Adamu, security expert and CEO Beacon uh, Consulting. Thank you for joining us on Newsnight.